going live. Hey y'all, I'm James Wright and welcome to the shop. Tonight we're going to have a lot of fun making some arguments and having a lot of people really mad. So this is one of my favorite things to do. Um, as my wife will attest the, uh, the cute one down there in the blue Snuggie. Um, yes, she will... Uh, she knows I, I like to make arguments for some reason, but uh, <laughs> we are going to be talking about accuracy and, uh, and, and precision. Um, at what points is it really important and what points is it not? Because that is, um, yeah, a lot of people have problems with that. So um, next, just a little bit of the cleanup. Next week, um, we are probably not going to be having the live as I doubt I will have internet connection. Uh, we're going to be gone for the next week and a half or so. Um, but then the following live after that will probably happen. Um, so stay tuned. Um, but we're going to be hopefully getting some sleep and heading out tomorrow morning. So um, wish us luck. <laughs> hopefully the flight is on time. But uh, who knows. Um, i trying to think if there's any other cleanup things I have to do. I don't think so. Did we have to pick a winner from Oh, the yes. Thank you. On the notepad down beside... Um, on the other side, um, there is a name, yellow notepad. I think it may be underneath the keyboard, the other keyboard. No, the other, the other keyboard. No, right there, underneath the little glass thing. This thing, oh, your phone? Oh, underneath yeah. my phone, yes. <laughs> I'm so glad we're talking about accuracy. You can't even tell. So, um, yeah, we picked a winner from last week, and the person is getting a $20 gift certificate to the Wood by Wright store. So what is their name? Chris Collins. Chris Collins. Um, I did comment on your um, uh, on your comment. So send me an email and I will get that sent out to you. So congratulations. And uh, yeah, we had a, a good Christmas and New Year's and uh, looking forward to 2022. In the year 2022. I'm looking forward to it too. What? 2022. Oh, I, uh, JJ was like, oh, wait, soon it's going to be the year 2222. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, you, you wait for that, bud. <laughs> so, um, yes, precision and accuracy. Now, this is one of these subjects that um, if you are a machinist, if you are an engineer, um, or if you spend time in CAD, um, this is one of these things that it really will bother you when it comes to woodworking uh, because in woodworking it's one of those gray areas where there is no such thing as accurate um, there's always a, a big gray area where you have to find out in different places that gray area can be really big in some places that gray area is pretty small so I want to kind of look at some of the instances and show where some of the common problems are with with understanding that um, but one of the things you'll, you'll often hear is that a machinist will measure to the ten thousandth of an inch an engineer measures to the thousandth of an inch uh, and then it, you know it, it gets bigger and bigger and so then you have you know your master cabinet maker that it measures uh, to the closest 32nd of an inch your average woodworker is you know somewhere around a, a 16th of an inch a house carpenter yeah give or take an eighth to a quarter inch you know a boat builder they, they measure to the nearest boat um, so it's one of those those common jokes that uh, in different places you measure to different amounts uh, but when you're first getting started at YouTube and Instagram really make this a problem because there is an expectation of perfection. When you look at a fine piece of furniture or you, you first see a picture and you, you recognize it as a fine piece of furniture, you're expecting perfection. And you, if you don't see any flaws, then there is an assumption that there are no flaws. And this is a very common thing through all of YouTube and Instagram. And it actually takes more work to show those flaws because most of the time the camera isn't running. And so if something happens in the shop, it's probably not going to be caught on a camera because it isn't always running. And then number two, it's just easier to show it from one point of view. It's harder to actually get in close enough to see that problem and to really know that, oh yeah, that does have a bit of a gap in there. Um, so it takes more work to actually show that off. And so because of that, there is an inadequacy in a lot of people when they see all of these great pieces of furniture and design and they think, well, yeah, I see my work. The problem is when you're doing your work, you're working on it like this and you're seeing it in detail that 4K, 8K could never reach. 
it is incredibly fine and because you are the one who made it, you see every little flaw, every tiny bit that's wrong with it is very, very obvious to you. And that really, um, it drives a lot of people crazy. Uh, most engineers and machinists, if they ever get into woodworking, they either have one of two things. Either they have a ton of jigs and they make everything exact and they spend more time doing the actual setup and getting things dialed in to make it work than they do actually making the, the cut. Or they get frustrated and quit. And the latter is far more common. Um, I get comments all the time from people like, I just can't make this work. I, I can't get rid of any of the light underneath the, the square. You know, I put my, my square across the board and no matter how many times I go across it, I always see light underneath there. And that's just going to drive you bonkers until you realize that I always see light. I don't care what board I did. There's always light underneath a metal square. And woodworking, that doesn't matter. Um, so, yeah. Um, first things first is understand that there is no such thing as perfection. It's not a location. It is not a joint. Ooh, that's a perfect joint. There is no such thing as a perfect joint. Perfection isn't a location. It's a direction you head. So you will never get there. You can always try to make things more and more and more perfect but they will never be perfect. You can aim towards that, you can go towards it, but never expect to get there. And once you understand that, then you'll understand that, yeah, there's some gaps and flaws in this one, and next time I make it, it might be a little bit better. And that's just the way of things. That is the skill of woodworking. Because when you're, work, when you're working with wood, wood moves. Wood has compression and expansion. Uh, wood is something that you can push together, and it will push apart it has a mind of its own and it's one of those things that you can never constrain it. Metal, metal's nice, you can constrain it and as long as you maintain the temperature, it's great. With wood, you have temperature, you have humidity, you have time of day, you have the moon cycle and it all conspires against you. So yeah, let's look at a few um, instances. Any questions before I jump in particularly? Um, before you started, Richard Buckman had asked, are you gonna talk about precision versus accuracy? Um, yeah, no, um, that, that, that's kind of a semantics difference. Um, some people will say they're the same thing. Some people say they're different things. Um, and in different contexts, they can mean different things. Uh, for the sake of this video, I'm going to make both of them basically mean the same thing. Um, but in reality, generally, you would say precision is your work. How close can you make something work? Accuracy is the result of your precision. Um, how close did it end up being? Um, and there'll be arguments back and forth on that. Um, but there's, yeah, for the sake of this video, they're the same thing. Um, so first, let's talk about dimensioning a board. So I've got this board here, and this is a five-quarter white oak board with a knot in the middle. It's got a little bit of a cup on it, uh, but it's a fairly wide board. So if I set this down and I started planing it, I would go at it with my scrub plane and make it flat-ish with the scrub plane. And I would have my first check with winding sticks. This is the first place that will drive you absolutely crazy. Now, if you may notice, this board I picked out is almost the same width as my winding stick. It sticks out a little bit longer. So that means this is not going to exaggerate the flatness of this that much. If I'm out a little bit one way or the other with winding sticks, then it's pretty much one-to-one. -one. If it looks to be about 16th inch off, it means I've got about 16th inch to remove. However, if I were to be flattening and jointing this board, and I put the winding stick on there, the winding stick is more, it is less than a third of this. It's actually almost a quarter of this. So any exaggeration in this would be um, almost four times as much. So if there would be a 16th out here, that would mean it would be a quarter of a 16th that's actually off. Um, but a quarter of a 16th, well, you gotta love the English system. <laughs> the imperial system, the American system, yes. Um, and some people will tell you if you're doing a really wide board with this, that means you need to have really wide winding sticks so you can exaggerate that. So if you do have that uh, four times the width, then you would have four times the variance, and that would allow you to spot it and really wind it out. The problem is, on a board this size, do I need to be going down to the 30 second of an inch uh, from one point to another? No, because this board is flexible within the 30 second of an inch from corner to corner. 
So if I'm out a 32nd inch from this corner to this corner, this is dead flat. Actually, on a board this size, I'd probably be happy with a 16th inch from corner to corner. So in other words, if this board had a twist where this corner was a 16th inch higher than these corners, so it was, it was twisted 1 16th inch, I, I would consider that flat because that is within the flexibility of this board. When I attach it down to a skirt, it will pull that out of it. Um, when I clamp it to another board, it will work that out. Wood is a flexible thing, so I don't need it to be dead flat. Um, so flattening is one of the, the big things, and yeah, I, I've seen quite a few people take a, a five-quarter board down to a half-inch board because they're trying to get it flat, and they just keep going at it and keep going at it. Um, don't, don't chase perfection. Aim for it, but don't worry if it's not 100% correct because it will never be 100% correct. Um, usually, I will go down on, on a board like this, I'll, I'll probably take it to a little bit less than a sixteenth of an inch twist, um, but at that point I really don't care because if I look at it and I stand back, if I imagine this is a tabletop and I stand back and look at it, I would not be able to see a sixteenth inch twist. Uh, in that case, it doesn't matter. No one would be able to measure it unless they actually came in with a straight edge and they checked it. And let me tell you something, no one's ever going to bring a straight edge to your table and check if it's perfectly flat. So don't worry about it. <laughs> My. Is that a super chat we got? It is. The wal Walnut Woodworker says, get yourself some hot cocoa. <laughs> Thanks, Walnut. That's for me, not you. What's that? That's for me, not you. Yeah, for Sarah. <laughs> you want some hot cocoa on a beach? <laughs> Sounds like a weird... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. Um, what? <laughs> oh, yeah, it was mom joke. Sorry. What's the difference between a dog and a marine biologist? Dog and a marine biologist. What? One wags a tail and the other tags a whale. <laughs> yeah, I like that one. That's good. <laughs> yes. Pleasant. <laughs> All right, let me see. Which board was it that I had? Um, I had a board here that I jointed earlier. Is it this one? Yes, it was this one. Okay, cool. Um, now this, I have an example because the next thing is, so we've got a flat board. And now we want to cut it to length and I want this to be perfectly 90 degrees to my reference surface. And I cut it square and I plane it and I put this on here and I hold it up to the light. Oh my, there's still light coming through there. I have light coming through right here and a little bit over here. If I really hold it up to the light. So the question is, if I ran a plane over it again, would I eliminate it? No. It's, it's a board. It's, it's wood. It's got pores. It's got holes. And the light is much, much thinner than any pore in the board. <laughs> You'll be able to notice every time. So it doesn't matter how perfect you get that edge. You will never get a board that has no light coming through it if you hold it up to the light. Now, most of the time, I'm going to check it down here like this. I am not going to hold it up to the light. And I'm going to look at it like this, and I'm going to say, can I see my bench through it? If I can't see my bench through the gap, then it's good. If I can see my bench through the gap, then I'm probably going to adjust it. But if I ever hold it up to the light, I'm always going to see light through that gap. Um, especially with a lot of the porous woods, oak and ash and hickory. It doesn't matter what way you hold it through there, you're always going to see light coming through underneath. Um, so hold it up to a dark space and see if you can see down through that. If you can, then you're going to need some more work. If not, then don't worry about it. Don't, don't stress about the light. Um, and the same thing with, with checking for, for flat. Um, putting this across at every point, there's no way you're going to get it smooth enough to actually get that perfection on there. Um, if you go and look at some of the, the masterpieces of you know, the, the French Renaissance and some of the most amazing woodworking covered in marquetry and carving, you won't get a flat, smooth edge on any of them. You hold a straight edge up to it, and they're, they're all slightly wavy. They're all slightly curvy. That's because it's wood. Wood will move. Wood will change. And there is no such thing as perfection. Just a direction you can head. Um, one, two, what was the other one? Oh, yeah, same thing goes for then checking along the length of the board. And this is another really common one. Is, let me actually flip this over so you can see something here. So this is this is a fun one. Uh, I want to focus on my hand right here. There we go. Then let's get the small one. So on this one, 
I'm going to put this on here. So this board, this board is actually really good. It's jointed really well. And as I slide this along here, actually, let me zoom in a little closer. Let me bring it up to like here. Yeah, there we go. That way I can get this right underneath the lens. So we're going to be in focus. I hit right about there. So at this point, you're not going to see any light under here. But if I held this up to the light, you would definitely see light underneath there. Now the problem is, if it came out at like that, now you can see, actually I don't know if you can see that or not. It's really hard to see focus on this one. Oh, let me see, it's set, it's set there we go. And now I can see it better. So on this one, at there you can see I've got, what about a 30 second of an inch gap on the far edge over there and touching over here. That would be another pass. A plain shaving or two would take it back into it. And that's about the point that I would that I would start to work at it again is if I take a plane shaving across, am I going to half the distance? One plane shaving, half the distance, that's what I want. If it's more than than uh, if it's more than two plane shavings, then I might take a couple passes. But if it's only one plane shaving out, I'm not going to take another plane shaving from the other side because then the other side will be down to plane shaving. Um, so don't chase that back and forth. If it's less than a plane shaving, if it's um, you know, less than two plane shavings, then I, I don't mess with it. it it's accurate enough. Um, and so that's one of those things that I don't worry about. Um, yeah. What's the, the question I just got, saw? Happy. It says, Happy New Year, and thank you for all you do. Thank you, Josh Caddy. Thanks, Josh. Do you have a mom joke? Ah, uh, let's see. I'm sure. Oh, well, she's uh, looking. Go do something else. Right. I got to so, find one. Um, the other thing that you're going to have when you're jointing or when you're flattening or when you're planing anything, if you're trying to bring something down into a true surface, um, never, un never expect that you have to take a plane shaving from one side to the other. Um, unless you're jointing a board and you know the board is flat and I just need to take out a little bit here, in that case you're going to want to joint the whole board. But if you're talking about a surface or you're just talking about a finished edge, um, there's no reason for you to joint the whole board and take a shaving down the whole thing. If it's, excuse me, if it's twisted in the middle, then just address the middle, take a shaving or two, and clean that out, straighten its edge. Um, never feel like you have to do the whole surface, especially when you're doing a whole flat surface. Um, if you're smoothing something out and flattening it out, if you're, you know, a little high right here in the corner, don't take a shaving from one side to the other. Just hit that high spot and take it down. Um, most of the time when you're planing, you're just hitting the high spots. Never think that you have to take a shaving off the whole thing because most of the time a plane will ride up and down those bevels. If you just hit the spots where they're high, then you can bring that down into the same plane as the rest of it. So just hit the high spots. Um, you take the hot spots. What questions we got before I move on? I have no questions, but I have a mom joke. Ah, oh, what's the mom joke? How do you make the number one disappear? Put it in my pocket when I walk away. The number one? Mm-hmm. It's an expensive tool. Not a number one. The number one. Oh, how do you make the number one disappear? What? Add a G and it's gone. Oh. Spelling. I know. You, I knew it wouldn't be your favorite. You don't like <laughs> I had to spelling. I think about that one a little too long. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, here's another fun one. When doing a joint, um, you want them, I mean, most of the time, if it's a glued up joint, you want it to be something that can slide together with a little bit of force. It, it, it won't, gravity won't take it together, gravity won't pull it apart. But you want it to be something that will work together. And this one is actually really nice. It's just that right amount of friction. I can pull it apart and I can put it together, it kind of pops into place. It holds itself nicely. You know, I can wiggle it out, but it takes a bit of force to, to do that. The problem is, Getting that precise fit is incredibly difficult. And most of the time, you have one of two things that happen. Either, number one, you make the mortise too big. And I'm talking about mortise and tenon in the broad sense of, you know, um, pins, and, uh, pins and tails. You're, you're creating a tenon to go into a mortise. It just happens to be open on all sides. In this case, you know, it's a mitered um, half lap joint, but you still have a mortise that the tenon fits into. Um, and in this case, you have one of two problems. Either 
the mortise is too big or the tenon is too small and there's a gap in there. They're, they're too loose and they slide in and out. In that case, um, as long as these surfaces are decently flush, then you can just use a glue, a glue that has a, a gap filling capability to it, um, such as uh, epoxy or something of that nature. Uh, and don't overstress it. Most of the time, if that's the only, if that's the joint that's holding it together, then you're going to want to spend some time to make it better. But most of the time, you're going to have other joints in the device, and you're going to have multiple joints adding to the strength. If ever something is held together at one pinpoint, it's probably a bad design. Um, you want multiple points of contact because they're not all going to be perfect. Some of them are going to have some slop in them. And so if it's too big, then generally that's okay, as long as they're not all too big. Um, use something that has a little bit of a gap filling to it, and you're good to go. Do not use Gorilla Glue. The, 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 the uh, poly, not polyurethane, the oh, poly something. Um, the poly glue that expands and foams, don't use it. That is bad. It is not gap filling. I know it expands. It makes it think like it's gap filling. It's not. Um, that's absolute trash and a lie you've been told. So don't do it. Um, if you don't believe me, go look at my glue tests. <laughs> um, I was going to say, oh, the next problem you can have is that it doesn't fit together and you force it together and you wiggle it together and either one of two things are going to happen. Either one, it's going to go all the way in, but the mortise sides bulge out or number two, um, it cracks the wood. Now, if it cracks the wood, you keep it cracked and you put some glue into that crack, you pull it apart and you let the pressure of the wood glue itself back together. Then you take off a little more material on one or the other until it fits in. Um, if it doesn't crack and it does go together, well then in that case you have a surface that's sticking out a little too, a little too high because it's been spread. Well that's okay, just take a plane and plane it down, smooth it out. And you've got a good strong joint. It's not cracking it any at all. It's compressed all the way around. Um, as long as it fits your characteristics and you can smooth it out, don't, don't really worry about the joint size in comparison. If it's not a perfect fit, then oh well, it's not a huge issue. Um, don't, don't really overstress it. And there's some places, like knockdown joints, you actually want a bit of wiggle room in there. Like in this one, this one has, um, whoop, focus, there we go. This one has a lot of wiggle to it. And you can see the, the gap on here, Let me bring it out here so you can see. There's a, what about a, a sixteenth of an inch gap here. And you want that because this needs to be able to slide apart and come back together. Now, actually, this tenon is actually pretty good because this dimension is nice on it. It's this dimension that's smaller. Um, and you want something like that because this wedge is going to come back in here. And even the wedge in this is, is really loose this way. But when it all comes together, the pressure will lock it in. And now it's good and tight, this whole thing puts together and is a good tight fit. So having this perfectly tight um, doesn't really need to be. Um, and when almost all of your joinery, there's a wide expanse about what is that perfect joint pressure. And there really is no perfect joint pressure. It's always eh, somewhere here, somewhere there. Sometimes you want it a little bit loose. Sometimes you want it overly tight. Sometimes you want to be able to clamp it together. Um, if you're ever jointing two boards together, and there's a gap in the middle. Well, if they're longer boards, most of the time you can just put a clamp on it and clamp it out. Uh, having a sprung joint is actually a very common old method. Uh, you take two boards, and when they're jointed, you actually have the bottom one with a concave joint like that, and the top one has a concave joint like this. So when they go together, there's about a, a sixteenth of an inch gap in the middle, and when you clamp those two together, you actually get rid of that, and you can do the whole thing with one clamp in the middle, putting even pressure, pre even pressure all the way along it. Um, so having a bit of a gap in the middle isn't really a problem. Glue it up, and you're good to go. Um, that, that, there was one other thing I was really wanting to touch on. Um, oh, I just had it. Just disappeared. I should have written it down. What questions we got while I'm thinking about it? Okay, so this was from what you were talking about earlier. Um, Ken Carlisle asked, how do you actually measure that 1 16th of an inch variance in flattening? 
I guess it might be something where you just recognize it. Uh, no, it's actually winding sticks. Um, so you put the winding sticks on there and you'll be able to look over the top of the winding sticks. So if they're perfectly level, you won't see, they will both disappear at the same time. However, if there's any twist in the board, you'll see the one in the back stick up more than one inside the other. And you can just look at it and see, oh, this stick in the back is sticking up a 16th inch more out here. Um, so if it's something like this, where the sticks are four times as long as the board is wide, then if I saw, um, if I saw an eighth inch difference between these two, I would know that one quarter of that uh, would be a 16th inch. Um, no, it would be a 32nd inch. So I'd know from one point to another, there'd be a 32nd of an inch twist difference. Um, but I would have to see, um, what? I'd have to see a full quarter inch difference between these two sticks um, to know that there's a 16th of an inch difference on the board. Hope that makes sense. Um, yeah. <laughs> but winding sticks, these are actually really useful. And then they, they come in all different lengths and sizes. 99.9% .9 of the time I'm using these that are about 18 inches long. Um, I have a set that are four foot long. I generally only pull those out if I'm doing a really big slab or I'm doing a bench top. Usually I like my stick to be about twice the, twice the length of the board's width, um, but it doesn't have to be. As long as you understand what that variance percentage is, then you're, you're good to go. Um, so every joint has a different amount of flexibility to it. But then it comes back to, okay, I'm preparing this board to be used in a project. How much time do I really have to spend making this absolutely perfect and 90 degrees on all edges? And generally, other than your reference surface and reference face, your reference edge and reference face, the rest of them really don't matter 90% of the time, unless it's actually coming into contact with something else. So let's look at this joint, for instance. Um, in this joint, let me flip back around to this one. So in this one, we've got, let me take it apart. So I've got this board. Now, if I were to be dimensioning this to begin with, imagining the board continuing out past here, this dimension here and this dimension here do not matter in the least. If I'm off a 16th inch, if I'm off an eighth inch, if I'm off a full inch, it's not gonna make any difference because this, these measurements here do not affect this. The only thing that's important here is that this whole face be perfectly flat. This whole face doesn't even have to be square to the side. It would be nice, and that tells me that this board is then coming off at 90 degrees from this one. But the only important thing is that this whole side be perfectly flat. So if I put a straight edge across there, not a square, just like the straight edge across there, at any point, it is giving me a nice flat reference surface. That way when this comes into here, I know I'm not gonna be seeing any gaps on this joint. I just need to make sure that's flat. When it comes down to this, then I have the dimensions um, of this, which are determined by my mortise. Um, and in this case, I want them to be a little bit sloppy so that I can move them in and out easily by hand. Now, when it comes to this board, this dimension, the width of the board this way, doesn't matter at all. It doesn't intersect with this. The thickness of the, this board matters a little bit. And so in this case, I'd probably want to be within a 16th inch because I need to make sure that the wedge fits in here. But because this is a sliding wedge, I could make this slightly wider and that means the wedge would just be up here. Or I could make it slightly smaller and that means the wedge would be down a little farther. Um, so there is a good bit of variance in the thickness of the board this way. In the thickness of the board this way, it doesn't matter. Uh, and especially when you get down to following plans, and this is what really drives a lot of people bonkers, is the plans give a specific measurement. The plans would say this board needs to be three and a half inches by inch and a half, because it's a two by four. <laughs> but in reality, it doesn't matter because nothing references the thickness of this board. Now, somewhere else in the project, something might reference that, in which case then it would be important. But for this particular application, this joint, that measurement doesn't matter. Even though the plans say it has to be three and a half inches, it doesn't. It can be anything you want it to be. So understanding the difference between a joint that ma a measurement that matters and a measurement that doesn't matter can be very freeing in woodworking. What's the joke? Or are you had? Or should I just keep going? No, you are getting faster. I'm sorry. This is a really, really exciting topic for me. <laughs> I could me. tell I was like, oh, we're going to reach two times speed and get a squirrel giggle without needing to speed up the video. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is, um, 
understanding when something matters and when it doesn't is the difference between a beginner and someone who knows what they're doing. Because a beginner follows plans to the T. And the, every measurement matters because if the measurement is on the plan, therefore it must matter. And someone who knows what they're doing then looks at the plans and say, well, that measure doesn't matter. And I've got some stock over here that's close. I'm just going to use that. Um, and just understanding where you need to be accurate and where you don't. And most of the time, in most all of joinery, if you're within a sixteenth of an inch, you're golden. There, there's very few instances where you have to be under a sixteenth of an inch. The only places where you need to be tighter than that are generally in joinery, in your mortise and tenon. And then in that case, usually within a thirty-second of an inch, you're, you're good. Um, because wood has some flexibility and compression, you can, you can squeeze out a gap of a thirty-second on just about any board. And so understanding where you have to be precise and where it really doesn't matter is very important. What questions we got? I don't think we have any. All right, we'll throw some questions in here because I'm, I was talking a lot faster. I was expecting to be at 45 minutes right now. We're only at 30, so uh, I've got some time to do that. Uh, <laughs> the, yeah, then the, the problem is when you get joinery that shows, um, like this one. Let me, uh, let me bring this in and focus up. So in this case, especially when you start getting into things like dovetails and people really start expecting perfection, um, right here, this, pin, this, this gap here, there's a, there's a really heavy gap there. And that's, uh, what about, 30 second of an inch. Doesn't matter at all. Uh, any PVA will fill that without any problem. Um, any wood glue worth its matter is going to fill that in. And you're never going to see that, that crack once it's glued. Um, a lot of people really look at joints when they are freshly put together and they're not glued. And once you glue it up, and you clamp it up, almost all cracks disappear. It's amazing what a glue up, finish up, uh, glue up, clamp, and finish can do to, to joinery. And even if you do have three or four gaps that are, you know, 30 second inch or a little more, actually that one's a little bigger. That's about a, eh, just shy of a sixteenth. Um, any gaps that do um, show up, aren't going to change the functionality of this. If I put half of these that have a little bit of a gap in there like that one, you know, 16th inch or so, this is still going to be a functional joint once it's glued up and put together. And understanding the difference between functionality and really going overboard towards perfection um, can be very, very important uh, because we all want things to look good and we all want them to look as good as Instagram, but we'll never get as good as Instagram because in Instagram, we have an expectation of perfection, and so if we don't see a flaw, if we don't see a flaw, we expect perfection. But I guarantee you, the person who made that is going to be like, "Oh, that's yeah, it's not great. Uh, I could do better than that." And it's one of the things that I would, I would love for everyone to come to my house so I could take you around to the furniture furniture I've made and I could point out flaws. Um, whenever people come to my house, I try to point out some flaws because there's this sudden realization of, "Oh, well, his work is human." And every furniture maker I've been to, from the best of the best to the basic beginner, when you actually go and look at the, per the, the, the furniture in person, you'll see flaws. And it is a freeing experience to realize this person you have idolized over the years makes furniture just like I do. Because the material we're all working with is the same material. It's wood. It moves. It expands. It contracts. It changes over the years and you're going to see things that aren't absolutely perfect. And that's okay. That's life. That, that's reality. Um, so don't expect perfection. Expect functionality, but don't expect perfection. Just okay. Relax. It's really Take a breath. Funny when you say all of those characteristics and then put your spouse in that instead of wood. <laughs> well, in that case, I do have perfection. So. <laughs> Ooh, I'm sorry, yes. everyone. Everyone's spouse is just trying to get more and more like mine. I'm, that's just the direction it's going. But. That's why I'm so short. I achieved perfection early on. No. <laughs> <laughs> what questions we There's got? a lot hiding under the Snuggie tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, bum, bum. Woodworking with Logan. Any tips for making nice fingers or dovetails? Um. <laughs> Practice makes things better, um, but 
the, the most important thing is your marking. Even if you're going to do the, all the layout ahead of time, or if you are going to do it one step at a time. Whatever mark you make, number one, make sure that mark is as accurate as you can. Try to use a missing knife. Oh, I put it away. <laughs> Try to use a knife rather than a pencil because a knife is actually cutting the wood. It's slicing the fibers. Everything on one side of the cut goes, everything on the other side of the cut stays. Um, if you can do that and you can get this mark accurate, then your saw cut will be more accurate. If you trust your mark, then you have to know how well do you trust your saw. If you trust your saw and you trust your mark, then hit that mark exactly and it will all come together. If you don't trust your saw 100%, but you trust your marking, stay away from it just a hair and sneak up on it. The slower you can make the adjustment, the better the chance you're going to have a working joint. And sometimes that sneaking up means using a chisel. Sometimes that sneaking up means coming in it with a fine file and detailing it back and spending a little bit of time really working that tail to get as close to perfection as you can. Because sure shooting, if you come in with a chisel when you should have used a file, you're going to take off too much and create a joint, create a gap. Um, so try and get as close to the line as you can, but when you get close to it, use the appropriate tool to move the wood as slowly as you can. That'll give you a little bit better joint. But then, when you do have that gap, it's okay. It's still a functional joint. And the only way you're going to make perfect joints every time is if you've been doing it for years and years and years. And it doesn't matter how good your tools are. It doesn't matter how accurate and how slowly you do something until you have the skill that is built from doing it over and over and over again for years. You're not going to make them absolutely perfect every time. You'll get close to it, but it, it takes a while to build up that skill. And that's the big difference between power tools and hand tools. With power tools, the skill is in setting up the jig. If you have the jig set up right, any monkey can run it through. With a hand tool, it's not about the jig. It's not about the tool. I can set up, where is it? I can set up my dovetail saw beautifully, absolutely perfect. You could slide a needle down the teeth. It's gorgeous. It's amazing. Actually, you couldn't because it's a rip cut. Um, but if I set this up absolutely perfectly, you still need this, the skill to run it. And that's where the skill is, is actually in the use. It's not in the setup or the function. And that is, that's actually something really hard for a lot of people to understand, is that the only way to get that skill is to do it. I can teach it all day long. I could have you here in my shop and I could talk you through it and oh, your arm is doing this. And I could get you a little closer, but until you get the chance to do it a few times, you're never gonna learn it. Um, or you're never going to get high quality. Um, you'll still get functional. Any beginner um, with a practice or two can do functional dovetails. That's, that's expected. Um, but making them perfect, um, that takes a lifetime. What's next? Memeplex asked, why are speed squares triangular? <laughs> um, well, actually, it's because, do I have mine up here? I don't have mine here. I don't use them that much. Um, that's because they're not, uh, they're not for um, cabinet work. They are for, um, uh, they're for framing. Um, so you can actually use them as a protractor and you can set angles on there. Um, they're great for roofing and house framing. They're not great for, um, for cabinetry. Um, they're not generally made up for that. Um, they're made up for doing quick and dirty marks that are yeah, close enough. Um, you can actually set them up. Some of them have roof measurements of um, roof pitches such as a, um, a, a 1 to 12 or a 12 to 12 roof. Um, and so you can actually make marks at what your pitch is, um, or you can put your pencil a certain distance away from the fence, fence and use it as a marking gauge. Um, there's lots of uh, quick fun functions with those um, that, uh, yeah, if you, if you actually get into um, house carpentry, um, there's a lot of uses for them. And, uh, they're a fun tool. Just don't use them much in the shop. Um, with that being said, I do actually, um, I had one in here, which I probably got rid of it, um, with my shooting board. If your shooting board is set up for 90 degrees, you put a speed square on there, and now you have a mitered shooting board. You just set your board up against the mitered, uh, up against the, the speed square, put your speed square up against the fence, and now you can shoot your boards at exactly 45 degrees. Um, and I do that for quite a while. It takes a little bit to hold it in place, um, but it actually works really, really well. So um, tip for it, have a little bit of fun. What's next? Um, 
Let's see, Michael Curry, please comment about what variations in the angle of a joint does to the strength of a load-bearing member of an assembly. Can you read that one more time? Yes, I sure can. Comment about what variations in the angle of a joint does to the strength of a load-bearing member of an assembly. I have no idea what you're asking, man. The difference of angle. Um, How does that affect the strength? Well, like, uh, load... <sighs> Most everything in the assembly of a piece of furniture is load-bearing in one way or another. It just depends on how much it's load-bearing, uh, how much load it is bearing. Um, but I don't know, because yeah, you have angles everywhere, um, and some are 90 degrees and some are others, and I, yeah, I don't know what you're, what you're referring to. But feel free to send me an email if you have pictures. I'd be glad to look at some specific instance. Um, but yeah, I don't know, sorry, what specific thing you're asking about. What's next? Richard Buckman, let's see, when you have one piece fitting into another, what is the spacing, what is the spacing when the piece wiggles too much from when it wiggles nicely to when it's a tad tight to when it will break something? Every joint is different. It depends on how it's coming together. Most of them, you want to be able to push them together with your hands and gravity doesn't pull them apart. They should still come apart if you wiggle them, like that it comes apart, but you should be able to slide them together with your hands. Now, a few instances of that is dovetails, um, or when there's a lot of friction connection to it, like this one, I have three tails across a three and a half inch board. Um, in that case, um, let's see, this one, yeah, this one's a little bit too loose for me to put together with my hands. Wow, this one's really, too tight. That's it. Not too loose. Too tight um, to put together my hands. So in this case, uh, most of the time with dovetails and there's being a lot of friction, I want to be able to push them together about halfway. In this case, I can push them together about two thirds of the way um, by hand, and then I want to be able to pound it in the rest of the way as long as I can see that it's actually going to come together. Um, but then there are uh, mortise and tenons. If it's a long mortise and tenon, I may actually design it with a thirty-second of an inch gap. Um, all the way around the joint because if it's a long tenon, you know, uh, two, three, four inches long, I need a little bit of wiggle in there so I can wiggle it down into place. Uh, or if it's something like this, like a knockdown joint with a, uh, a tusked tenon, I want a lot of wiggle in that so that I can get it down into place. Um, so every joint is going to be a little bit different. And most of the time, if it's too loose, glue can fix too loose joints. Or you can put a pin through it and, and strengthen it up that way. Um, if it's too tight, well, then you're, you're saved because you can still take off more material. Um, too tight is always better than too loose because you can adjust too tight. Uh, too loose, you can't adjust anymore unless you fill it with something else, um, which that's what glue's for, uh, or sawdust and glue, or shavings and glue, or put in a whole other wedge of something, or popsicle sticks. I've used popsicle sticks a few times to fill gaps. What's next? Ken Carlisle ask. Okay, after you've bashed some joinery that's a little too tight together for a test fit, what's the safest way to get it apart? <laughs> um, yeah, every joint you want to you want to make sure that your movement is in constraint. So, and this with a dovetail. So let me put this back together. Um, this is a dovetail. The the pins slide into the tails. Um, so in this case, I don't want to wiggle it apart like this. Because when I'm, when I'm twisting this board, I'm putting a lateral strength in those and I'm actually spreading the pins apart. And so I could actually make those pins all crack. Um, so I don't want to twist it apart like this. I want to take the, the pins, I want to take the pins and pull them str straight out down. Now the problem is I can't pull straight down because this is too tight. So in this case, I'm gonna set the whole thing on the bench and I'm gonna raise the whole thing up and I'm gonna have it hit the bench at one time so that my tails slide down. Now making sure that all my force is going straight down so that I can get it out and once it comes to a point that I can impart a little bit of wiggling, there, now I can impart a little bit of wiggling to it and I can then wiggle it out the rest of the way. Except for I think I just pushed it back in the, yeah, there we go. I can do a little bit of wiggling there without putting too much pressure on it. Um, so it's always thinking about which direction do the boards need to come apart and then find a method 
to make sure that they just slide in that one direction without wiggling them apart. Because anytime you're wiggling it, you're introducing no forces that could crack the wood, or they could crush the fibers of the tenon, um, making it too wiggly when it goes back in. So, yeah. What's next? Let's see. Memeplex asks James, did you see Adam Savage's video on measuring out today? On measuring out? Correct. No, I did not. I'm usually about three or four weeks behind on his videos. Um, so I'll probably see it then. <laughs> Might be even further out after vacation. Yeah, I mean, as to... Uh, that's one of the, the hard things to say, is you can't say a sixteenth of an inch is good because in every application it varies. In some cases, the measurement doesn't change. It doesn't matter. If it goes in and out by an inch, it doesn't matter. It's not going to change anything in its function. But in some cases, a 36th of an inch is too big of a gap. Um, and it's always playing with at what points is it important and what points isn't. And rarely is it down to the structural integrity of the wood. Um, the, the measurement the, isn't going to matter for the structural integrity. It's going to matter for um, the, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Function um, of how does it go together especially if you have multiple pieces coming together where they all have to slide together at once. If you have a whole bunch of really tight tenons and you need to squeeze in five tenons or maybe six tenons, three on either side to squeeze in, um, and if they're all really nice and tight, that can be a lot of work to get them in, especially in the middle of a glue up. And so in that case, I might actually make all the tenons kind of loose individually so when they all come together, I can squeeze it together in an a, uh, appropriate amount of time. Um, so it has to do more with the, the function of the piece than its structural integrity. What's next? Uh, sorry. Um, Timothy Brown, how can you drill a hole in white pine without getting a frayed edge? <laughs> I'm afraid not. <laughs> um, the uh, auger bits, good auger bits, are worth their weight in gold. Um, because you have a spur on the side that will actually cut a circle before the blades start taking out material in between. Um, so I use these ones for wood owls. I have a couple videos on those. Uh, but some of the old ones with the two spur, the, the two wings, as long as they're sharp and you have a good spur that will score the hole in front of the cutting head, you'll get a nice clean wheel on the way in. Now on the way coming out of the wood, <laughs> ain't nothing gonna fix that. Um, the best way to do that is to come out the wood until the screw pokes out the other side. And so the only thing you see is the screw coming out. Then you turn the piece around and come at it from the other side. So the screw goes back in the same hole and you can use the spurs to clean cut the other side. So if you cut from both directions, then you'll get a clean entrance wound because there is no exit wound coming out. Um, but if you're going all the way through the wood, ain't nothing gonna make a really pretty uh, finish. Though some are a little better than others. Um, they're all gonna leave some tear out. What's next? Uh, let's see, the walnut woodworker asks, what is your opinion on using dividers when laying out dovetails? Um, it is a quick and easy way to make sure you have accurate, evenly spaced dovetails. <coughs> it doesn't matter though. Um, in the functionality, um, in the durability, um, laying them out with dividers isn't going to make them any more functional, isn't going to make them any more usable. Um, it's just going to make them look prettier because you get this perfectly even spacing. Um, so if you're doing a lot of them, usually I'm going to lay out dovetails on one. I'm going to lay them out with the dividers on one. And then I'll take that around as a story, um, storyboard and I'll transfer that one board to every board um, rather than using dividers over and over and over again because they might get bumped or changed. Um, it's better to make a storyboard to transfer to everything. Um, but most of the time, if I'm just doing one drawer um, or if I'm doing a set for a box, I don't use dividers, I just go by eye and I'll lay them out. And your eye is actually really accurate um, because the only reason to use dividers is to make them look good to your eye. But if you lay them out by eye and they look good to your eye, then what's the point of the dividers? Um, so in that case, if I'm just doing one box, I don't do them that much. If I'm doing a whole bunch of them, such as a case of drawers and you're gonna see all these dovetails side by side, um, then I'm probably going to lay a storyboard out on uh, one stick and then use that to transfer all of them so that they're all the same. Um, but that's, it's, it is hard, it's easy to make one board by eye and look good. It is hard 
to make multiple boards by eye that all look good and all look the same. You can make each individual board look, look good, but making them all look the same is very difficult to do by eye. So that's usually my perspective. What's next? Let's see. Ken Carla, Carlisle asked, do you have a video on sharpening curved iron such as combination plane yes. um, cutters? Um, I have a video on doing 45 and 55 cutters. Um, it's an old one, but the information is still good. Um, the two, two worries that I often get with that. Um, number one is that it, you, people think they need to have a slipstone or something that matches the profile perfectly, and you don't. It just has to be, it has to be smaller than the profile. So if I have a, uh, let's say, a half-inch radius curve, I can use a quarter-inch dowel with sandpaper around it to sharpen with that. Um, I don't need to have a half inch radius um, dowel to then um, put sandpaper on. It can be smaller than the, the curve. Um, the other one is a lot of people go out and they buy a 45 or a 55 and they have all the cutters and they think they need to go through and sharpen them all because they're all dull. Don't. 60% um, of those cutters you will never ever use. So there's no reason to sharpen them unless you really want to have them all sharpened. Usually I only sharpen a cutter if I'm needing to use it. So if, I'm, if I have a project coming up and I've got this cutter that I'm wanting to use, then I'll sharpen it. Um, but I won't sharpen them um, unless I need to. So just be forewarned. Just because you have 45 cutters doesn't mean you're going to use 45 cutters. You're probably only going to use 10 of them in your lifetime. <laughs> it's just the way it goes. What's next? Um. So Carol Cakes asked, when making a marking gauge, how loose is too loose? Um, oh, I think you're talking about the, the beam. Um, you can actually make them really, really loose. Um, they don't, the, you want them to be able to, you want the beam to be able to slide through. Um, and so it should still have a, a good bit of waggle to it. This one is a, um, is a Stanley that I use quite a bit. And so it's got a, a good bit of, there's probably what, a sixteenth inch all the way around with a gap on there. Um, you don't need it to be, um, you don't need it to be perfect. Because once the screw goes down, the screw clamps it in place and will constrain it so it doesn't need to move around. And if there's a little bit of tip in this side to side, that's not going to make any difference um, because the measurement isn't going to change from here to there by this tipping a little bit. So don't, uh, don't really worry about being perfectly tight. You want it to be able to slide on its own gravity up and down the piece. What's next? Let's see. Meanplex asks, um, it's unrelated to the topic. I want to build a large bed frame with knockdown features using only joinery and no glue, um, preferably without too much sticking out. Any ideas? Um, yeah, actually, that's what I did on my, um, on my bed. Um, so if you go back and look at the, the, the bed frame that I have, um, I made it, what, three years ago? Has it been that long? It's been about three years, yeah. Wow. Um, it's, yeah, it's, I did glue it all, but it is all, um, it's all pinned joinery. Um, so one of the, the great things about doing draw bore pin is the tenon doesn't have to go all the way through. I usually have the tenon go through a quarter inch and stick out a quarter inch, and then I kind of pillow it over so it's an added feature. But if it, if it stops short of going all the way through, you can still pin it and then cut the pins flush so you don't have anything sticking out. Then for knockdown, the, the stretchers that go from headboard to footboard, um, on mine, I have them stick out a quarter inch, and so they're pillowed over just like the other ones. But then I have a steel pin that goes in um, that holds it in place. So when I want to, I can pull that steel pin out. And the steel pin only sticks out, eh, three-quarter inch or so. Um, and it's, it doesn't... Uh, it sticks out less than the, the detail on the top of the bed. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the way I would go because it's the way I did it. But there's lots of other designs. Um, if, you, if you want more inspiration, um, look at, um, what's the word? Um, campaign Furniture. Um, Schwartz did a, a book on that uh, a while ago. Uh, but he has a, a couple in additions to that. Most of the time they're tusked tenons which means they stick out a good bit farther. Because you have tusked tenon, so it's sticking out a good bit farther, you can put a tux through. Those are great and easy and functional, um, but often doing pinned tenons, they don't go through all the way and you put a pin through the board, um, those tend to be a little easier. The 
problem is pins is they're harder to pull out. Um, unless you did like I with a, a steel L pin, so the pin comes out and wraps down, you have something to grab onto and, and, uh, and pull out a little easier. Um, but uh, yeah, go take a look at those videos. I did a, a pretty decent um, build series, like six or seven videos going through the whole series on that one. What's next? I think we're Got about out. 54? I think we're about it then? I <coughs> cool. I inhaled too much dust. Okay, um, then I think we're going to wrap this up. We won't be doing a live next week, so um, at least we probably won't. Yeah, we won't be doing a live. <laughs> <laughs> um, I but, plan uh, on being someplace much warmer. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, see you in two weeks, and we're going to have some good bit of fun between them then. Um, yeah, so I think I'll do it. Anything else from you? Yeah. Until next time, have a wonderful day. Bye. Bye.